Okay, so we'll uh, carry on with, uh, uh, with uh, chapter 13 about spectroscopy. Uh, today we are going to look at the four important information in an NMR spectrum. Anytime you are looking at an NMR spectrum, you need to look for these four different pieces of information. First one is the number of signals. How many signals do you have in your NMR spectrum? Second, their intensity. And this is usually measured by integrating the area under the peaks. That tells you about the relative number of hydrogens that you have in, well, that are corresponding to every uh, peak. The third, splitting pattern. How does it look like? Does it look one peak, two peaks, three peaks, four, five, etc., which we will call splitting? or multiplicity. What is the multiplicity of the signal in your NMR spectrum? And the fourth, the chemical shifts of the signals. So we always need to look at these four different types of uh, uh, information when we are looking at any NMR spectrum. For instance, if I look at the NMR spectrum of ethanol in uh, chloroform, in deuterated chloroform, I notice that there are three sets of signals. This is the first signal, this is the second signal, and this is the third signal. How many different protons do I have in ethanol? How many sets of hydrogens, of different hydrogen do I have? I have three. I have the CH3, I have the CH2, and the hydroxylic hydrogen. And in fact, I have three signals. That's the first signal, this is the second signal, and this is the third signal. The appearance of these peaks. I have the signal, uh, this is the, the expansion of the signal. It is in fact split into four peaks, which we will call later as a quartet. And the ratio is one to three to three to one. We will talk about it also today. But the appearance of this peak is a Quartet. I have uh, a one peak here, which we will call uh, singlet, and I have uh, this peak. Again, this is expansion of this peak. It is split into three peaks, which we will call a triplet. We will understand later why do we have this peak to be split into three peaks and this peak into four peaks. The chemical shift. I have the chemical shift of. Uh, these hydrogens at around 3.7 uh, uh, part per million or 3.65 part per million. This one is around 2.5 or 2.6 part per million. And this one is around uh, 1.4 uh, part per million. Integration. The integration is the area under the peak. Now, when you are having the integrals as such, what you need to do you just measure the distance. So let's say this is the integral. What you do is you measure the distance between the lower and the upper levels. So if you are having this first integral and you are uh, having, uh, this is the first one is the CH2. And you have another one which is here. And you have another one which is right here. When you measure this distance, and this distance, and this distance, and you are going to get the ratio of it, that will tell you about the number of hydrogens that corresponds to every set of uh, uh, peaks. So if this is 1, and this is 2, and this is 3, this tells you that the ratio of the number of hydrogens that corresponds to this peak is 2 to 1 to 3. It could be that you have 4 hydrogens to 2 hydrogens to 6 hydrogens. It could be also that you have 6 to 3 to 9. So you are getting the ratio of the number of hydrogens that are associated with these peaks. So we have uh, the chemical shifts, the number of signals, the integration and the splitting. 
This is what we are going to do when we, are look, when we look at any NMR spectrum. Now, first, we will address why do we get different signals, and we have actually addressed that before, so I'm going to go over it again. When you are having protons that have different chemical shifts, this tells you, this tells you that the, chemi the, the protons are chemically non-equivalent. And therefore, they exist in different molecular uh, environments. For instance, when I look at this NMR spectrum, I have two different signals. Both of them, they appear as uh, singlets. But the fact that I am getting two different signals, that tells me that I have... Uh, two sets of hydrogens that are chemically non-equivalent. I have uh, two hydrogens here, and I have three hydrogens here. Both of them, they appear as singlets. But can anybody tell me why do you think the green hydrogens are more downfield than the red hydrogens? Yes. That's correct. You have an electron withdrawing group, the C triple bond N, and you have an electronegative atom, which is the oxygen. Remember, the effect is cumulative. This will lead to having these two hydrogens to be more downfield than these three hydrogens. I get them as two different signals because they are chemically non-equivalent. As I said last time, how do you find out whether hydrogens are chemically non-equivalent? Just replace a hydrogen by any arbitrary atom. Name the compound. If you get the same name, that tells you that the hydrogens are chemically equivalent. For instance, if we replace these hydrogens or this hydrogen by a chlorine, we are going to get one chloropropane. Therefore, these three hydrogens and these three hydrogens are chemically equivalent. Now, what about the stereotopic protons? Well, we call hydro two hydrogens to be diastereotopic if you replace either hydrogen by a chlorine, and then you are going to get a set of diastereomers. For instance, if you take this hydrogen, you are going to get the, and you replace it by a chlorine, now you will get the chlorine and the bromine to be cis, while if you replace this one, you are going to get the chlorine and the bromine to be trans. Therefore, these two hydrogens are called diastereotopic hydrogens. Diastereotopic protons, they are chemically non-equivalent, and they have different chemical shifts. In this particular example, you will get this hydrogen at 5.3 parts per million, and this hydrogen at 5.5 parts per million. Another type of diastereotopic hydrogens. Well, when I am looking at this compound, how many chiral centers do I have in this compound? I have only one chiral center. This is a chiral center, carbon number two. Now, these two hydrogens are prochiral, meaning if you replace one of these two hydrogens by another atom, you are going to get a chiral center. So we will call this hydrogen a pro-R, and this hydrogen is a pro-S. If you replace this hydrogen, let's say, by an X atom, that is going to get you the S uh, stereoisomer, or the, S, uh, the, the chirality of this carbon is going to be an S. The configuration of this carbon is going to be an uh, S. And if you replace this hydrogen uh, by uh, an arbitrary atom X, that will get you a configuration of R. Therefore, you are going to get uh, R and S at this chiral center. And therefore, the relation between these two is going to be a diastereotopic relation, because this is the same. Well, this is 1, 2, 3, this is an uh, R. So you're going to get an RR and an RS. The relation between these two is diastereotopic relation. These two hydrogens uh, are diastereotopic hydrogens, and therefore uh, they have uh, different uh, chemical shifts. Sometimes, though you are getting the two hydrogens, they are two diastereotopic hydrogens, and they should appear at different chemical shifts, the chemical shifts might be very close that you will need a higher field spectrometer so that you resolve uh, and you will be able you resolve the, the two signals and you will be able to see them uh, separately. Enantiotopic protons. They are uh, in mirror image environments. 
And if you replace uh, one hydrogen or the other, you are going to get two enantiomers. Enantiotopic protons, they have the same chemical uh, shift. For instance, this is uh, a compound that is achiral, but if you replace uh, this hydrogen by a chlorine, you will get the S uh, uh, enantiomer, and if you replace this hydrogen by a chlorine, you are going to get the R enantiomer. These two hydrogens are enantiotopic. They appear at the same chemical shift unless you use a solvent that is chiral. So if the solvent that you are using is chiral, then the two enantiotopic protons, they will appear at the different chemical shift. Okay, moving on. Regarding the splitting, of course, not all peaks are singlets. We are going to encounter different splitting signals. They can be split by being coupled to nuclear spins. For instance, if you look at the 1,1-dichloroethane, we are going to see the green hydrogen as a quartet and the three hydrogens as a doublet. This is called the quartet. It is split into four lines. This peak is split into two lines. It's called a doublet. These hydrogens are splitting each other. We are going to understand why in a second. Now, before we go any further, we need to talk about the splitting relationship. These two hydrogens are called geminal hydrogens, as we learned in organic one. The two hydrogens are attached to the same carbon, so the relation between these two hydrogens is a geminal relationship. While these two hydrogens are vicinal, they are attached to two adjacent carbons. If you are having a geminal coupling, that will be called a J2. And if you are having a vicinal coupling, that will be called a J3. J is the symbol of what's called a coupling constant. How much is the coupling constant as a result of these two hydrogens splitting each other? Of course, any time you are talking about splitting, the two protons must be non-equivalent. Hydrogens that are equivalent, they do not split each other. So only, you only observe splitting when you are having hydrogens that are non-equivalent. What we are having here, we are having the red hydrogens to be non-equivalent to the green hydrogen. The three hydrogens are splitting the green hydrogen into a quartet. And this hydrogen, the green hydrogen, is splitting the three red hydrogen into a doublet. You are seeing this one as a doublet as a fact, as a result of having this hydrogen. So the green hydrogen is splitting the three hydrogens into a doublet. And uh, you are having the three hydrogens to be split the green hydrogen into a quartet. So the CH3 splits the CH and the CH splits the CH3. Now why? Why do we observe uh, splitting? Well, these three hydrogens are feeling the green hydrogen. So let's say this is C1 and this is C2. We are going to talk first about the methyl protons uh, being split by the methane proton. Well, what you are having here at C1, you have a one proton, and therefore you have a nuclear spin. That nuclear spin can be either uh, parallel or anti-parallel. It can be having either the plus half spin or the minus half spin. So the C2 protons, they feel the effect of both the applied magnetic field and the local field resulting from the spin of C1. This means that you are having one signal or uh, you, are, you are having one line to be reinforcing the magnetic field while the other one is opposing the magnetic field. 
It can be either plus half or minus half. If it is minus half, therefore, it will be shielded. If it is plus half, it's going to be deshielded. Because you are having one hydrogen, you can have either plus half or minus half. And that, the result of this, the chemical shift in absence of, uh, in absence of any splitting, in absence of uh, any coupling, the chemical shift of the methyl is going to be, uh, or the splitting of uh, the methyl group is going to be only one peak, but with coupling, it's going to be two. It is two because you can have a spin of plus half of, or minus half uh, for this hydrogen. Now, what about, uh, what about the splitting of the green hydrogen? Well, this green hydrogen is going to also feel the effect of the applied magnetic field and the local field resulting from the spin states now of three protons. So you can have either plus half, plus half, plus half, or you can have the first one plus half, the second one plus half, the third one minus half, which means two parallel, one anti-parallel, but you can also have plus half, minus half, plus half, which means the second one is anti-parallel, the first and the third are parallel, or you can have minus half, plus half, plus half. So you have three combinations where you are having two to be parallel and the third is anti-parallel. You can also have a combination of minus half, minus half, plus half, minus half, plus half, minus half, plus half, minus half, minus half. You also have three combinations of having one plus half and two minus half. And the eighth combination, it will be having all three to be minus half. The fact that you are having one combination, three combinations, three combinations, one combination, that is going to lead into having a quartet, four peaks of ratio, excuse me, one to three to three to one. Because you are having one combination to three combinations to three combinations to one combination, that is going to result in having a quartet and the ratio of the peaks uh, uh, will be one to three to three to one. Now regarding coupling constant, how do we calculate a coupling constant? Well, when you are having a triplet, you can get the chemical shift of every peak. The coupling constant right here is the same as right here. You calculate the chemical shift by simply subtracting 1.697 minus 1.673, so the distance between these two, and then you multiply it by uh, the spectrometer frequency. So if you are having the NMR on a 300 megahertz NMR, you are using a 300 megahertz NMR machine, you subtract these two and you multiply it by 300, that will get you a coupling constant of 7.2 hertz. If you calculate this distance, it must be 7.2, but this distance should also be 7.2. The same when you are looking at the coupling constant here in the quarter. The coupling constant J3AB is the same as J3AB, same as J3AB. A and B are the two protons that are splitting each other. This distance must be the same as that, must be the same as that. That's why we only report one coupling constant for a quarter. We don't report the three different coupling constants. It must be the same. Now, for simple cases, how can you detect the multiplicity? Of course, we are not going to start doing the different combinations of the uh, spin nuclei and then decide whether I am going to have a doublet or triplet or quartet or pentet or sextet or, sep or septet and etc. For simplest cases, the multiplicity of a signal is equal of a certain uh, proton is equal to the number of equivalent vicinal protons plus one. When we were looking at CH3, CH2X, you say that these two hydrogens are seeing three hydrogens. Therefore, they are going to be split into four. 
These are three hydrogens are seeing two hydrogens, therefore they are going to be split into three. So they are going to be split into the number of vicinal protons plus one. So when we are looking at one bromo a thing, the multiplicity of these three hydrogens is going to be triplet because they are seeing two vicinal hydrogens. And these two hydrogens are going to be split by, the, by these uh, three hydrogens into a quarter. Again, the green hydrogens are more downfield because they are closer to the electronegative atom, which is uh, bromine. If you are having vicinal, only one vicinal proton, what you are going to see as a is a doublet. And the ratio of the peaks in the doublet is one to one. If you are having uh, two equivalent protons to which the hydrogen is coupled, then you are going to see a triplet. Ratio is 1 to 2 to 1. If you are having a quartet, it's going to be 1 to 3 to 3 to 1. If you have uh, four equivalent protons, you are going to see a pentet. The ratio is 1 to 4 to 6 to 4 to 1. If you are having five equivalent hydrogens, the multiplicity will be sextet. And the ratio is 1 to 5 to 10 to 10 to 5 to 1. And if you are having 6, you are going to have a septet. The ratio is 1 to 6 to 15 to 20 to 15 to 6 to 1. Notice, if the number of the split peaks is even, what you are having, two middle peaks that are largest in uh, height and to the outer, smaller. If you are having an odd number, then you are having a central peak that is uh, the highest. It has the largest height. And then uh, to the left and to the right, uh, you are going to get uh, two peaks that are smaller inside. You don't need to memorize these numbers in terms of uh, ratio. But the central peak uh, in an odd number of split peaks is going to be the largest, while in an even number, you are going to have two peaks that are equal uh, in uh, height. Now, what about multiplicity, for instance, of the isopropyl group? In an isopropyl group, what you are having, this hydrogen is split now by six hydrogens. And the six hydrogens are split by this hydrogen. So you are going to have a septet, doublet kind of uh, splitting pattern. Here is an example. You are having the green hydrogen to be split by six hydrogens. The appearance of this peak is accepted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you are having the six hydrogens to be split by only one hydrogen. You're going to have a doublet. If you measure the ratio, if you measure the integrals under the six hydrogens and the one hydrogen, you should get a ratio of one to six. Again, the septet is more downfield because it is closer to the bromine. Okay, before I go any further, I would like to take uh, questions. You had a question here earlier? Uh, yes. Um, uh, more depends on the, on the spinning of field. Lyle configuration is affecting the non-equivalent hydrogen. Why do you get non-equivalent? Mm. You mean why do we get non-equivalent hydrogens to be overlapping? Because they are, name the compound, you will get two different compounds. If you are having a cis hydrogen, you're going to get a cis stereoisomer. The other one is trans. Stereoisomers, they have different properties. They are different compounds. But it depends on electron configuration. No, it, it depends on the spin, on the nuclei. Yeah, so they will be, you will get two different hydrogens and you will get two different chemical shifts for the diastereotopic hydrogen. They might overlap. And this is the next section when I will be talking about overlapping hydrogens. They might overlap. If they overlap, you might need to have a higher frequency NMR machine so that you will get them to be separated. Okay? I'm going to talk about later. If I have two triplets and these two triplets are coming together, okay? If the distance, uh, you are having two triplets and these two triplets, they come close to each other. Now, what are you going to observe? One, two, three, four, five. The two triplets might appear as a pentet. 
they might also appear as a quartet if they are overlapping the central ones here. They, uh, they will appear as a triplet if they are equivalent. Okay? So you can have two triplets. These two triplets, they might appear as a pentad or a quartet or they might appear as a triplet. Okay? You have a question there? Because you are talking about the number of combinations where you are having a nuclei, you are having three of them, uh, you are having uh, three different combinations where you are having two parallel and one anti-parallel, and you have three other combinations where you are having two anti-parallel and one parallel. It's a matter of mathematical uh, combinations, as simple as that. Yes, ma'am? That's right. All of them. All of them, it's only one splitting constant. The distance is going to be the same. And I'm going to be talking further about splitting constants. Splitting patterns are not always uh, symmetrical. One of them might lean in the direction of the other. Let's talk about, having, let's talk about these two vicinal protons. And uh, we are having these two vicinal protons to be chemically non-equivalent, which means that they are splitting each other. Let's have delta nu to be the difference in chemical shift in hertz between the two hydrogens. And let's have J to be the coupling constant between these two hydrogens and the unit of this J is hertz. If you are having these two doublets to be very far from each other, meaning that delta nu over J is very large, then you are going to have a two separate doublets and we say we have a system that is called an AX system. A, X, both of them are in uh, the two alphabets A and X. A at the beginning of the alphabet and X is towards the end of the alphabet. So they are very far from each other. That's why they call it AX. Now if this delta nu, delta nu over J decreases then you are going to have an AM system. The AM is in the middle of the alphabet. So you are having the delta nu over J to be smaller. Now what you are going to have, not two clean doublets. Rather, you are going to have what's called a scoot doublet. So when you are having these two doublets to come close to each other, they are going to be scoot so that the outer the outer peak of the doublet is going to be smaller. The inner is uh, larger or longer. The same for this doublet. However, if this delta nu over J becomes very small, then what you are going to have, uh, these two doublets are coming too close to each other, and you might mistake two doublets for a quartet. And that is called an AB system. A and B are just next to each other in the alphabet. Now, of course, if you are having delta nu to be zero, that means you are having the two hydrogens to be equivalent, and therefore you are going to have an A2 system. A, two hydrogens, they do not split each other if they are equivalent. So you have the AX system, two clean doublets. They are of equal height, height. Then you are having the AM system, now you will get two scoot doublets. The outer is shorter than the inner. And then you are having the AB system. You need to be careful with the AB system because the two doublets will have the appearance of a quartet. And of course, the simplest one is the A2 system because all hydrogens will be equivalent. Let's look at one example here of two scoot doublets. You have parachloro, parachloro aniz, uh, anizole. Well, there are a couple of things in this NMR spectrum. At the beginning of this chapter, I told you it should take you two seconds, probably less than two seconds, to identify a compound to be a para-disubstituted 
benzene. And here is the perfect example of recognizing that this compound must be a para disubstituted benzene because you are having two doublets, two doublets in the seven part per million, ratio one to one, two doublets in the seven part per million, ratio one to one, it's definitely para disubstituted because in all other disubstituted benzenes, you will not get a ratio of one to one and two clean doublets. Now, why do you think that these hydrogens are more upfield than these hydrogens? Oxygen. Yes, sir. Why? That's not the reason. Oxygen donates electrons, shares electrons. How? That's correct. The reason you are having these two hydrogens to be upfield is that oxygen is giving electrons by resonance. So we have two effects here, the inductive effect and the resonance effect. The resonance effect of oxygen is much stronger than it, the inductive effect. Oxygen is taking electrons by inductive effect because it is an electronegative atom, but it is donating much more electrons through conjugation between the lone pair and the benzene ring. So we are going to get these two hydrogens to be upfield, and these two hydrogens are going to be downfield, and you are having uh, two scoot doublets because this delta nu over uh, J, we are having an AM system here. Of course, these CH3 are going to appear as singlets. You do not have uh, any hydrogens that are vicinal uh, to these uh, three hydrogens, uh, and therefore they are going to appear as uh, singlets. Here is a very interesting example, which is a metanitrostyrene. In metanitrostyrene, first I would like to concentrate on these uh, three hydrogens, H1, H2, H3. The relation between H1 and H3 is a cis relation. I have J3 coupling here, one, two, three. So I have the J cis coupling. And I have H1, uh, the relation between H1 and H2 to be trans, one, two, three. When you are having two hydrogens that are cis, and they are splitting each other, which means they are not equivalent, the coupling constant is 12 hertz in the region of 12 hertz. So you need to calculate the coupling constant to know whether these two hydrogens are cis or not. If you are having two hydrogens that are non-equivalent and they are trans, therefore they are coupling each other, these two hydrogens, the coupling constant between these two hydrogens is in the order of 16 hertz. Now, this H1 is split by H2. It is also split by H3. H2 and H3 are not equivalent. So you cannot say that H1 is split by two hydrogens, which means it's going to appear as a triplet. It is split by H2 differently from H3. In fact, it is split by H2 by 16 hertz in 16 hertz, while the coupling constant is 16 hertz, while H1 is uh, split by H3 with a coupling constant of 12 hertz. So what's going to happen then? Well, H1, in the absence of any coupling, it's going to appear as singlet. It is split by H2 into 16 hertz, so the two peaks, the distance between these two peaks is 16 hertz. But H1 also feels H3 which means that these two peaks are going to be split by H3 also in two peaks. What is the distance between these two? Well, each one of them is split by a cis hydrogen. Therefore, the distance between these two is 12 hertz. And what you are going to observe is what's called a doublet of doublets. Why do we call it doublet of doublets? Well, H1 is split by H2 into a doublet. Into a doublet. H2 is, uh, or the result of H1 being split by H2, is split by 
H3, which will make each one of them as a doublet. The result of this is a doublet of doublets. That's what you will get. Now, without calculating or if I don't have H1, H2, H3, can anybody tell me how can you identify which one is H2 and which one is H3? I am labeling H2 and H3 in the NMR spectrum, but can anybody tell me how do you know that this is H2 and this is H3? That is the answer. H2 is trans with respect to H1. H3 is cis with respect to H1. The coupling constant of trans is larger than cis. Now, without doing any calculation, can't you see that the distance between these two peaks right here is larger than this distance? So that must be the trans hydrogen. This must be the trans hydrogens because the distance is larger with a trans splitting than in the cis splitting. If you have the numbers, you calculate coupling constant, you will see that this coupling constant is going to be around 16 hertz, while this coupling constant is going to be around 12 hertz. Yes? OK. So we know that H1 must be doublet of doublets. Why? It is split by H3, and it is split by H2, and it is split differently by H3 from H2. H1 is split by H2 into a doublet. Each one of the two peaks that form our doublet is going to be split by H3 into a doublet. The result of this is doublet of doublets. 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1, doublet of doublets. Now, H3 is split by H1. If H1 is split by H2 and H3, it means that H3 is split by H1 and H2 is split by H1. H2 is split by H1 into a doublet. H3 is split by H1 into a doublet. This is a doublet and this is another doublet. One of them is a trans splitting, the other one is a cis splitting. Trans splitting is larger than cis splitting. That's how I know that this must be H2 and this must be H3. When a proton HA is coupled to HB, HC, HD, Having coupling constant JAB different from JAC, different from JAD, the proton is going to appear by, is going to be split into n plus 1 peaks times n plus 1 peaks times n plus 1, times n plus 1, times n plus 1. Let me illustrate that with an example. If I have This example, what is the multiplicity of these three of these six hydrogens? Because they are equivalent. Quartet. Why quartet? Why did you say quartet? Did you say quartet? Ah, oh, sorry. You mean these three are split by these three? Yes. But I just said that these six hydrogens are equivalent. Equivalent hydrogens do not split each other. They are going to be appear as a singlet. Why? You do not have any vicinal hydrogens. Vicinal hydrogen because this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. The closest hydrogen is separated by four bonds. That will be J4. These two hydrogens, you are having one, two, three, four. So these six hydrogens are going to appear as a singlet. What about this hydrogen? What will be the multiplicity of this hydrogen? To split by one hydrogen, we have a double bond. So if I am calling this as H2, this is H3, this H2 must be doublet. Because it is split by only one hydrogen. Now what about H3? What is the splitting? of H3, the theoretical splitting of 
H3. So what will be the theoretical appearance of H3? Doublet of triplet or triplet of doublet? Right? It is split by these two into three. It is split by this one into two. So it's going to be appearing as a doublet of triplet. Or triplet of doublet. What about this H4 hydrogen? What will be the theoretical appearance of H4? It is the same. I have here H5 to H5. So it's going to be exactly the same like here, doublet of triplet, triplet of, but the coupling constant might be different. Why? Because H, uh, H4 is split by uh, H3 and H5. Um, we're talking about H4 is split by H3 and H5, while H3 is split by H2 and H4. Now what will be the appearance of H5? Triplet. H5, these two hydrogens are split by two H4. So you are going to have here a triplet. Okay, another example. My question. What is the splitting pattern of HA? Doublet of triplet or triplet of doublet? And that will be the wrong answer. It's not going to be doublet of triplet. It's not going to be triplet of doublet. It's going to be only triplet. Why? Is equivalent. Equivalent hydrogens do not split each other. HA is only split by two HB hydrogens, and the appearance of HA is going to be definitely a triplet. Non equivalent hydrogens split each other. Equivalent hydrogens do not split each other. Okay, another example. How many different hydrogens do I have in this compound? All hydrogens. Yes. How many different types of hydrogens do I have in an iso? Four. Correct. This is HA. This is HB, this is HC, this is HD. What will be the multiplicity of HD? Triplet. HD is a triplet. Why? Because it is coupled by two equivalent HC. These two HCs are equivalent. And therefore, HD is split by two equivalent hydrogens, it's going to appear as a triplet. What will be the multiplicity of HB? Doublet. HB is only coupled by HC. This HB is coupled by HC. This HB is coupled by HC. It's, they are equivalent. You are going to get it as a doublet. What is the theoretical? Coupling of uh, HC. Doublet of doublets. doublets, theoretically. But if HC is seeing HB and HD the same, therefore, the coupling of HC will be triplet. Why? Because if you are having this coupling constant to be similar, then you are having two doublets to come close to each other, and therefore, you are going to get a triplet. So theoretically, you, are, you, you should see HC as a doublet of doublets, but you might see it as a triplet. 
If you see it as a triplet, that tells you that uh, HC is seeing HB and HD as uh, equivalent hydrogens. Uh, coupling constant. Now, what about the full NMR spectrum of metanitrostyrene? We already analyzed this part. We analyzed that I have uh, this one as a doublet of doublet, that is this hydrogen. This is going to be the trans, this is going to be the cis. Now look at the pattern in the aromatic region right now. How many different hydrogens do I have in metanitrostyrene? How many different aromatic hydrogens do I have in metanitrostyrene? Four. This hydrogen. Different from this hydrogen, different from this hydrogen, different from this hydrogen. So let me label the hydrogens on the board, and then I ask you to label them on the proton NMR spectrum. So that I use the same drawing. This is HA, this is HB, this is HC. And this is HD. Tell me, where is HA? Yes. This one. Actually, this is not a singlet. It is a singlet that is split uh, with what's called long-range coupling. And I'm going to elaborate on that uh, uh, actually starting now. Long-range coupling is a coupling that is larger than J3. You could, you could have a J4 coupling. J4, it means it is separated by four bonds. Of course, you don't, say, you don't observe J4 regularly. But in this example, you do have J4. And we have uh, a better example in the questions that I will post on uh, Moodle. And there will be a J4, a very nice uh, example about J4 coupling. What you are having, this one should appear as a singlet, but it is coupled with either HB or HD. At this stage, I'm going to tell you either HB or HD. This is long-range coupling, one, two, three, four. You observe usually long-range coupling when you have a W shape uh, between the two protons. This is a W shape. This is a W shape. Now, tell me, which one do you think is this peak? This one. Among HA, HB, HC, and HD, which one do you think is a triplet? C? Theoretically, HC should be a doublet of doublets. But HC is seeing HB and HD close to be equivalent, and that's why you are seeing it as a triplet. Now, which one do you think is HB? Or among these two, which one do you think is HB and which one is HD and why? The one at eight point something is what? HB. Why? Closer to the nitro group. Nitro is an electron withdrawing group. Right? So you are having it more downfield. Now, this doublet, therefore, is which one? HD. HD. Having said that, now tell me, is HA having long-range coupling with HB or with HD, and why? We agreed that we are having long-range coupling in HA. If, it, if there is long-range coupling, it is, coupling with, um, it is coupled with another hydrogen. Which one? Is it HB or HD? And why? HB. Why? Because you can see this doublet having also some kind of coupling for every peak. The same kind of coupling that you are having in this peak, you are having in every peak of the doublet. If this hydrogen is coupling the second hydrogen. That means this hydrogen is also coupling this hydrogen. 
Look at the appearance of this hydrogen or this peak. It is the same as the appearance for every one of these two peaks that are forming the doublet. So what I have there for, this is HA, this is HB, this is HD, and this is HC. Uh, 